Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to be hosting this conference the whole week. Today is the first day of the conference, and I already see colleagues joining in from abroad. Thank you so much. We have an unprecedented uh, participation for this conference, which I am so grateful to everybody. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Animal Medical Center's sixth annual One Health Conference, hosted by the Ann and Charles Johnson One Health Institute. The One Health concept uh, recognizes the connection between human and animal medicine and advocates a comprehensive approach to health and environmental problems. It aims to build bridges between physicians, veterinarians, environmental scientists, and public health professionals to promote, improve, and defend the health and well being of all species. The Ann and Charles Johnson One Health Institute at the Animal Medical Center allows our veterinarians to continue to work collaboratively through interdisciplinary research to help advance veterinary and human medicine. For the past six years, AMC has hosted this One Health Conference to bring together professionals to learn and engage with topics that affect our approaches to both human and animal medicine. This year, I am so excited uh, to be exploring the comparative approach of physical rehabilitation of chronic diseases. Every day this week, we will be introducing a new topic presented by two speakers, one in veterinary medicine and one in human medicine. We'll be hearing first from our human medical speaker, followed by our veterinary speaker, followed by an open discussion between the two speakers. And finally, you will have an opportunity uh, to accept questions from the audience, which you can do through the chat box. Okay, so I am going to um, switch over to introduce our speakers. So give me one second so that I can share, our, share my screen and introduce our two fantastic speakers for tonight. Okay, so this evening, uh, the topic will be on obesity management in orthopedic patients. This will be presented by Dr. Carolyn Andrew from HSS and Dr. Joe Wachschlag from Cornell University. Dr. Carolyn Andrew is joining us from the Hospital of Special Surgery. I'm so grateful that she has joined us this evening. She is uh, directing primarily weight management program at HSS. She is board certified in internal medicine and completed a fellowship specializing in obesity medicine. Dr. Andrews practice helps patients meet their optimal weight goal through lifestyle modification and the use of modifications, minimally invasive procedures, ultimately benefiting the health of the patient as well as improving their quality of life. She is a firm believer in implementation of individualized treatment plans and helping people lose weight and then maintain their weight loss and has presented at national and international conferences on the topic of obesity. Her talk will be followed by my friend and colleague, Dr. Joe Wachschlag, who is double boarded in nutrition as well as sports medicine and rehabilitation and veterinary medicine. He is an, a professor at Cornell University. He is the founding diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation and joined the faculty at Cornell in 2006. His research interests include obesity management and nutritional intervention for the canine athlete. And with that, I would like to pass it over to Dr. Andrew to give her presentation. Thanks so much, Leilani, and, and thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here and to be kicking off this great week. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, okay. Give me one minute. Okay. 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 Um, all right, good. So um, hi everyone, as Leilani said, um, I'm a physician at the Hospital for Special Surgery, 
My background is in internal medicine and I completed a fellowship in obesity medicine, which is a relatively new area of medicine. Um, and I'm excited to be here today. So let's get started. Um, I just have one disclosure. So I thought I would start by going through a case um, just to give you an idea of what my practice looks like. Um, this was a 54 year old man who has class three obesity, several comorbidities, including bilateral knee osteoarthritis and right hip osteoarthritis. And um, he was referred to me by one of the surgeons for weight loss before a right hip replacement. I won't read everything on the slide, but basically I just wanted to show that I really try to take a very detailed and thorough history, um, finding out about, um, just trying to change my view here, trying to find out about what patients have tried in the past for weight loss, what's worked, what hasn't, what do they struggle with, um, and really try to gather all that information so I can help them um, with their, their, the plan can come together. This patient's BMI was 44 when we first met. Um, I gather a medical, surgical history, review his medications, um, take a social history. This patient does have obesity in his family, um, no diabetes. And then I'll go through a food history. So asking a patient to recall what they've been having over the past few days and um, asking about how much takeout they do versus cooking. Um, do they eat late at night? Do they eat in the middle of the night? Of course, ask about exercise, which for this patient, um, and is pretty typical for the arthritis patients I see, um, he was frustrated because his ability to exercise was really limited due to his hip pain, and he had been very active in the past. Um, ask about sleep apnea, do the, does the patient use a CPAP, and then also ask about any history of mood disorders, has a patient been on any medications for anxiety or depression in the past. Um, on initial blood work, I um, like to see a CMP, CBC. Um, this patient did have elevated cholesterol and an elevated hemoglobin A1C, putting him in the pre-diabetic range. And then for this patient, um, we discuss um, some changes we can make to his diet. Um, he was interested in trying to use protein shakes as meal replacements. I also refer him to a dietitian who works with me in the practice and talk to him about exercise, try to figure out some sort of exercise he can do. And then I started him on a medication that's approved for weight loss, liraglutide. And I'll be going through that in more detail later in the talk. Um, and then we plan to have frequent and regular follow-up, which is so important for patients um, seeing me for weight management. So this patient did really well. Um, this is just the first two months. He actually was able to lose 20 pounds and he went on to do extremely well. He lost about 70 pounds over the course of a year, went on to have his hip replacement um, and still sees me for follow-up. So he did, he did great. Okay, so let's move on um, and talk about how we define obesity, how we measure it. As I'm sure many of you know, the easiest way to um, diagnose obesity is using body mass index, so weight divided by height squared. There are certainly many limitations to BMI, including the fact that it doesn't factor in how much lean muscle mass a patient has. So athletes are going to have an elevated BMI, um, but that's due to the um, amount of muscle they carry. So there are some other ways to measure adipose tissue in the body or assess risk. One of those is measuring waist circumference, a very simple measurement, and that can assess someone's cardiometabolic risk. There are also other mechanisms for assessing body composition. Um, DEXA can be used bioelectrical impedance can be used. Um, but we end up using BMI a lot because it's so easy and cheap um, and, and that's where we are. So obesity is a growing epidemic. Um, it's estimated that 60 to 70% now of the population is overweight or obese. Um, and the numbers are certainly rising, especially in the severe obese category. Uh, many comorbidities associated with obesity really touching on every 
organ system, um, definitely arthritis, certain types of cancer, heart disease, um, there, the list goes on and on. When um, we're talking about obesity and osteoarthritis, so a lot of the patients I see in the office, um, obesity is a known risk factor for osteoarthritis. Women with obesity have nearly four times the risk of knee OA as compared with non-obese women. And for men, it's about five times the risk. Um, and weight loss really helps. So one study showed that for every 11 pounds of weight loss, the risk of knee OA, uh, osteoarthritis dropped more than 50%. And what I find so interesting is that the risk is actually related to two issues. So there is increased pressure on the joints in someone who has a higher BMI, and that will lead to osteoarthritis. But there's also an inflammation associated with obesity that exacerbates the OA. And this is supported by the fact that patients with obesity are at, um, at increased risk for hand osteoarthritis. So not just the weight-bearing joints, the hips and the knees, but other joints as well. And the way obesity causes disease, just as it does with osteoarthritis, is that the fat tissue, the adipose tissue, actually releases proteins and adipokines that can go on to cause effects throughout the body. So until the 90s, it wasn't really thought that adipose tissue was very active, um, but now we know that actually it is, and it releases so many different adipokines and can have so these effects listed on this slide. Why is there an obesity epidemic? And you know we can't really talk about it without discussing diet and the changes in the American diet over the past few decades. So we know that the increase in use of um, or consumption of fast foods, in portion, the increase in portion size, the increase in consumption of sugar sweetened beverages, um, calorie dense foods. This is all going to contribute to this growing epidemic. Physical activity, of course, is part of this. Um, just sitting is associated with an increased risk for obesity. So this study actually adjusted for age, exercise, dietary factors, and found that every two hour increment spent watching TV sitting was associated with an increase in obesity and diabetes. So I think we all know about the, the diet and exercise aspect, but uh, a lot of what I do is actually look at the other factors that can play a role in someone's weight. And so one um, important factor is actually drug-induced weight gain. Many patients are taking medications that can cause weight gain and they aren't even aware of that. So um, one example is um, antidepressants. So SSRIs can cause weight gain in some people, not in everyone. Um, but one thing I can offer a patient is potentially to switch them from an SSRI that they believe is causing weight gain to something more weight neutral or bupropion, which has actually been shown to help with weight loss. Um, some other examples include the treatment for diabetes. So certain treatments such as insulin and sulfonylureas can cause weight gain. So if, it, if I can switch someone over to a GLP-1 agonist or an SGLT-2 inhibitor, that easy change can actually help with weight loss. And then other factors that play a role in weight, genetics, epigenetics, the gut microbiome is um, a very popular area of research now. Um, certainly medical conditions such as hypothyroidism, Cushing's, PCOS, um, and then psychiatric conditions as well. So binge eating disorder, night eating, sleep disorders, and it's important to, to think about all of these factors when assessing a patient. Okay, so how do we try and manage adult obesity? This was a treatment algorithm developed by the American Heart Association and the Obesity Society. It's meant for primary care physicians to have an algorithm they can use when managing obesity in the office. And, um, it's, it's extremely helpful and something that I think wasn't available when I was in residency, and we needed that in the office. We needed a clear algorithm to follow. And the algorithm um, recommends a 5 to 10% weight loss as the initial goal for a medical weight loss program. And that may not sound like very much, um, and it really isn't very much, but it 
holds a lot of clinical significance. So a 5% weight loss can actually prevent the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 50%. It can improve glycemic control, reduce blood pressure, triglycerides, improve fatty liver, knee pain. Um, and so that's a great start for patients and that's really manageable for patients. So if you know a patient weighs 300 pounds and we start with that 5%, 15 pounds sounds doable and reasonable to a patient in the office. The treatment of obesity is shown on this, the, the treatment options for obesity are shown on this slide. So on the left, we see diet and lifestyle intervention, which really offers about a zero to 5% weight loss. And then on the right, there are the more risky extreme procedures, gastric bypass, duodenal switch, and that offers 30 to 35% weight loss. And where we're working now in the field of obesity medicine is on filling in this treatment gap. So the five to 15% weight loss that we know can be so clinically beneficial to patients, but it's hard for them to get there with diet and exercise alone. So we now have some pharmacotherapy available for patients, some less invasive procedures that we're using as well. And I'll be going through these in, in more detail. It's important to mention that we know that patients with obesity actually have a dysregulation of these pathways in the hypothalamus. The pathways controlling food intake and energy expenditure um, don't work as well in a patient who has a higher BMI. Um, and that's another reason to use pharmacotherapy potentially in helping these patients. So an example is uh, when we look at the hormone leptin, Leptin is produced by adipose tissue, and it provides a signal to the brain, basically telling the brain how much adipose tissue, fat tissue is in the body. And so if a person has a higher weight, the leptin should tell the brain to decrease food intake and increase energy expenditure, and the patient can lose weight. That makes sense, but the problem is when a patient loses five to 10% of his or her weight, leptin actually goes down disproportionately. So it can go down 40 to 50%. It's telling the brain that the body has lost more weight than it has, um, which sounds very frustrating and it is. It makes it more likely for patients to have an increased appetite and for their metabolism actually to slow down and for them to gain the weight back. And we know that this is part of the reason why it's so hard not only for patients to lose weight, but then for them to keep it off. That's another challenge. So when I talk to patients about diet, there are so many diets out there. I think a lot of people are really overwhelmed by all the information out there. And what we know is that it really doesn't matter what diet someone follows, low carb, low fat, zone, weight watchers. It's really about what they can stick to. And so it's about finding a plan that they can really follow long-term. So I stay away from anything that's really restrictive because I just know that it's not likely for people to be able to do that. Exercise is tricky, with, especially with patients with severe osteoarthritis. So many patients come to see me and say, I can't lose weight, I can't exercise, there's no way I'm gonna be able to lose weight. And what I tell them is actually, you know, it's possible to lose weight without exercising. We know this from studies now that exercise isn't as effective as maybe what we once thought for weight loss. And really to lose weight with exercise, you have to be doing more than 150 minutes a week of exercise and typically a lot more than that. So it's hard for exercise to be the driving factor in your weight loss. What I tell people is that they should do what they can. Um, and I initially just assess them to see where they are. Are they sitting all day and not doing anything? Are they walking a little bit? So see where they are and then where can we go from there? Something is always better than nothing with exercise. And again, there is the importance of just avoiding the sedentary behavior. So if there's someone who is here, you know, if he's someone, a patient is someone who's sitting all day, getting them to stand up every hour and even walk around the apartment. That is something. Um, getting them to work on range of motion and flexibility, um, 
and also strength training if possible, maybe doing upper body strength training if they can't really do lower extremity work. Um, and then I try to, um, rec I try to refer to physical therapy as well. Um, chair yoga, some of my patients love. Um, this is yoga with Adrian, which has become very popular with my patients. Um, she offers gentle yoga and the patients can do it. Um, and then also swimming, of course, if they can access a pool, which has been even more difficult during COVID, of course. So pharmacotherapy for weight loss is approved as an adjunctive treatment to lifestyle interventions. There are five FDA approved medications. They're indicated for patients with a BMI greater than 30 or greater than 27 if they have a comorbidity. And the goal is to help with weight loss, but also to improve those comorbidities. So the hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, heart disease. So I'm gonna go through the meds quickly. I don't wanna spend too much time going into detail, but um, the first one is called Phentermine Topiramate. It was approved in tw uh, 2012 for chronic weight management. And um, Phentermine is an appetite suppressant and Topiramate's etiology is not exactly known, but um, it's related, we know that it's related to GABA pathways in the brain. And um, Topiramate actually has been used to treat migraines and treat pain in the past. When these medications are combined, patients um, can lose weight. And we see about um, an average of an 8 to 10% weight loss, depending on the dose that patients are taking with this medication. Bupropion and naltrexone was approved in 2014 for long-term weight management. So bupropion, I mentioned earlier, it's um, used to treat depression. It's also used for smoking cessation. And it's a dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It activates the POMC neurons in the hypothalamus. And naltrexone is actually an opioid receptor blocker, an antagonist. And again, when these are put together, um, it can help with appetite. I find this one works really well for patients with strong cravings. Um, some patients who feel like they, um, they tell me they're really an emotional eater, they have strong cravings for sweets. I've seen this medication really help those patients. And the weight loss varies depending on what study you look at, but we're seeing five to nine to 10% weight loss with this medication. So liraglutide was approved in 2010 for the treatment of diabetes and then later for weight management. And it's a GL, a glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist. It causes a decrease in gastric motility and also uh, centrally targets the hypothalamus and suppresses appetite. So this medication is definitely one of the more effective options we have right now for weight loss. Um, we're gonna see more of an eight to 10% weight loss on average with this medication. I will say that I've seen such variable weight loss with all of these medications. Some people do better than the average and some people do, do much worse. So it's really um, somewhat, you just have to try it out for a few weeks, see how they respond and then maybe switch to something else if um, the medication isn't working the way we want it to. This was an exciting trial for those of us in obesity medicine. It was uh, the LEADER trial published in the New England Journal in 2016, and it looked at patients with type 2 diabetes on liraglutide, and um, it was found that the patients on liraglutide actually had a 13% reduction in risk of death from cardiovascular causes from non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. So, it's um, exciting to have a medication option that seems to be safe and potentially beneficial, not potentially, and beneficial in patients who have cardiovascular um, disease. So more recently, semaglutide, brand name Ozempic, um, this, has been a, this was approved for type 2 diabetes um, a couple years ago, and um, it's now being investigated as an obesity medication um, at a higher dose than the, than the diabetes dose. And the, phase, the results from a phase three trial were just published, and they actually found that um, there was a 10.3 greater average weight loss in the patients on semaglutide. And this is better than any medication we've seen before. 55% um, of patients lost more than 15% of their weight, and 36% lost more than 20% of their initial weight. So again, really exciting um, to potentially have an even stronger medication for weight loss um, available for patients. 
I also use a lot of metformin for weight loss. It's an off-label use. Metformin, as I'm sure you know, um, it's used to treat diabetes, um, but it can help with weight loss. And um, it works in a few different ways, but it de decreases hepatic glucose production, um, affects intestinal absorption of glucose. And I find that some patients really respond to it. Um, they feel like it helps them with their appetite, helps them control cravings, and, um, and they do well with it. So to summarize, um, obesity is a chronic disease. It has a complex etiology, and it's definitely a growing epidemic. There are many comorbidities associated with obesity, and one of which is osteoarthritis. Medications are available to be used as adjunctive treatment for weight loss, and they can help prevent weight regain, and exciting new treatments should be available in the not-too-distant future. Even 5 to 10% weight loss can hold clinical benefit for patients, so that's our initial goal. And really the best treatment is going to be a comprehensive approach. So incorporating diet, exercise, behavioral interventions if needed, along with medications. And potentially, I didn't go into bariatric surgery, but referral to bariatric surgery if a patient is interested in that. So with that, I will close. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you so very much, Dr. Andrew. I am full of questions, but I am going to turn it over to Dr. Wachschlag for his presentation because I think that will likely spark, um, I hope, first discussion between you and Dr. Wachschlag, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So, um, Joe, if you want to go ahead and start your presentation, that would be great. Okay, let's hope uh, everybody will be able to see all this uh, stuff I'm putting on the screen. Let me know if you can't see it. We can see it great. That's perfect. All right, let me uh, try and get it uh, to present as if I'm really a presenter here. All right, so yeah, I think all those those high points that Dr. Andrew hit are kind of right on the, the nail on the head, and I wish I kinda could really start looking at all those wonderful drugs because I think we're kind of in the dearth of, of pharmacologic intervention in, in veterinary medicine, and I think we're going to be looking towards uh, uh, all the, the human interventions as they, as they come along, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about an oldie but a goodie here in terms of pharmacology that, that really is, is right down that same alley of the GLP-1 ag um, agonist there. So uh, as we know that uh, obesity is a problem, we've done a few studies on obesity in general, and this was uh, Gus, and Gus was uh, looked a little bit more like a tick than a dog, as you can see from this uh, photo from the top. And uh, I think uh, Gus's owner, Joan, knew a little bit about uh, mass in the universe. And for every pound uh, that Gus would lose, she would bring us brownies. And I think we all gained all of Gus's weight you know, during that obesity trial. So I'm gonna kind of go through some of the stuff we did as well as just some of the general thoughts about how to, how to intervene in canine obesity primarily. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of these pitfalls in, in terms of a plan. Um, and then also kind of get into the idea uh, that the cats are gonna be a little bit different just because of the nature of, of uh, cats owning us rather than us owning them. Um, and then activity, uh, uh, you know, it's great to hear that, that exercise can make a little difference, but it's really not the, the, the major um, intervention in any way, shape or form. It's really about trying to lead a healthy lifestyle. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the work that's been done there. And of course, this is a uh, Speakman is of course, talks a lot about human obesity and talks about uh, how this is really a physiologic and a genetic problem as well as a behavioral component. And, Thankfully, we don't have cocktail parties for dogs where there's you know, chips and uh, shrimp cocktail and all kinds of wonderful things for us to, to dip into every, every time we go to a party. And it's, I think it's fascinating. And maybe we could talk about the uh, quarantine 15 that everybody's gaining. Strangely enough, uh, even though we're not at, at all these parties and, and really kind of having a great time with our friends and, and drinking and being merry. So uh, I'd love to hear some of this the idea behind the the, the quarantine 15 as, as we get through this discussion later. But, uh, you know, I think this idea that we do have these sort of orexigenic and anorexigenic uh, components of our central nervous system and sort of our, uh, our, our peripheral hormones that are released uh, during, you know, during eating. And what you can see is we have sort of these central things that are acting at the level of the central nervous system, right? These orex orexigenic peptides that are listed that are sort of released from these, uh, POMC and agouti-related peptide uh, MPY neurons that sort of act 
in concert to try and control appetite, which is where the pharmacology is really heading. And it's, it's really interesting. And we have you know, anorexigenic agents, um, not that I've been to Studio 54, but there are a lot of lean people in New York City uh, that were on cocaine and amphetamines uh, back in the day. And that's because those were anorexigenic agents. And then uh, we have things like the endocannabinoids, right? Which is you know, cannabis, which gives you the munchies. So we know we can control these systems to some degree and how can we finally tune all of this? But what's probably more interesting is some of these peripherally related uh, peptides like ghrelin, which is you know, released from the stomach and kind of you know, potentiates an erexogenic behavior versus the list of different peptides that are listed uh, that are released from the GI tract leading to anorexigenic behaviors like uh, peptide YY, GLP-1, um, you know, all these various peptides that tend to be uh, acting at the level of these neurons in the brain to really kind of curb the appetite, which is, I think, very exciting on, on the human side and hopefully will translate over into the, into, uh, the, the veterinary side. And this is a, what I always like to talk to students about is the idea that we, we've had this here for a while. And this is actually one of the first GLP-1 um, peptides that was released for helping with diabetic control. And then in the fine print, even though it wasn't studied for weight loss, Victoza it said, you may see a suppression of appetite and, and you may lose a little bit of weight on Victoza because it was one of these GLP-1 uh, peptide-like molecules that was actually really having an effect at the central nervous system to kind of downregulate the appetite, which I think has always been interesting. And, and uh, my, my, my actual uh, uncle had been on it for a little while and, and he went from a four slice you know, pizza kind of guy down to a two slice pizza guy early on in his treatment. And it was very remarkable. But then again, all of this is, you know, the, the brain eventually tells you that this can't be true and you start to eat a little bit more. And so these ty types of interventions uh, are going to become fine-tuned to be more effective over time, which I find amazing. And I, I, I will say that we did beat the humans to the punch way back uh, in 2006 or seven when Slentrol was released, right? So there was actually a, a weight control drug that some of you may remember who are veterinarians on this call uh, that, that you know, were, were you know, basically fed the Kool-Aid that Slentrol was going to be the future of weight loss. And everybody said, well, Slentrol is a weight loss drug because it helps stop the absorption of fat. And so, you know, if you actually looked at it, the higher fat diets actually did better. And here's my little bad rendition of an enterocyte and how it might have uh, really been affecting uh, dogs in terms of their overall appetite while on Slentrol. It was the fact that Slentrol would go in and act as a microsomal transferase inhibitor and stop the microsome from making the chylomicron, which is this cool little star that I have over here. Um, whether you can see my little pointer here, this little star is a, is a, is a chylomicron that would be absorbed as fat. Well, what ends up happening is they would build up fatty acids inside the enterocyte, and those would actually go to the nucleus and act as basically a, a, a you know, we have a whole bunch of fatty acid binding proteins that actually are nuclear receptors. And what they found is that there was a fourfold increase in PYY in the bloodstream of dogs when they were on Slentrol. Now, PYY is very much a longer acting appetite suppressant, just like GLP-1. And so we were kind of at the forefront of obesity uh, medicine in veterinary medicine, but we just kind of dropped the ball because of all the strange things that were happening, like finding a Labrador that wouldn't eat it was amazing to some people. And they actually got scared and would take their dog off of it because my dog didn't eat for two days when we put him on a higher dose of the Slentrol. It freaked me out. So I didn't want to give it anymore. Or my dog vomited once, which was one of the major side effects. So we, we were kind of there, but we've kind of retracted and we've really not gone anywhere since then, since 2006 with the pharmacologic intervention. But uh, this is my favorite article because it was basically uh, done by Tony Buffington at Ohio State. And he and his technician basically did owner education programs uh, to really educate owners about weight loss and how important it would be so they basically, you know, hammered into these folks that, you know, the, the reasons for your dog losing weight and becoming healthier is because of the inflammation of obesity that was just talked about, the idea that we're going to uh, improve osteoarthritis, we're going to improve dermatologic conditions. So they would have these monthly seminars. And sadly to say, there was no improvement in the dogs who were on a weight loss protocol whose owners were getting education versus dogs that were basically just put on a weight loss protocol. And what they really concluded was the fact that they, the dogs that had to come in every single month for a weigh-in did 
just as well as ones that had a lot of education behind their owners in terms of why this was important. And it pretty much was deduced that the idea of Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or, or whatever weight loss program or going to see Dr. Andrew on a regular basis makes people comply. And so as a veterinarian, this is the hard part. We sell a bag of food or we tell people to lose weight and then we don't see them for a year. You're never going to be effective unless there's follow-up. So that's why we have to have this follow-up as a major part of our compliance. And so, as you know, the BCS system is, is what's used in, in, in dogs and five is perfect or might be even a little bit better. But once you get past six, seven, eight, nine, you start to have, you know, increases in adiposity up to, I mean, you know, we, we consider a six somewhere around 15%, 10 to 15% obesity in terms of what you should be losing. Seven is closer to 25 or 30%, you know, eight is really like 40%. So that's what we kind of gauge as, as our, our known, um, you know, body condition and how much we might have to lose based on that. But the reality is, is if you don't have a, an owner who recognizes this and, and doesn't understand that their dog is obese, we're never really going to get anywhere. You have to have the commitment of the owner. And then you also have to understand whether they've been through this before with another veterinarian or somebody else in your staff and, and whether you're going to be successful because I've, I've gotten tired myself of beating my head against the wall when people don't even know how much food they feed and they like would fill the bowl. You know, they fill it twice a day and he likes to eat. I don't know how much I feed. Well, you know, if you're not going to be able to comply and, and really make an effort, then it's really not worth my, my time you know, to try to educate you. But as we know, education doesn't do a tremendous amount. It's about the commitment of the owner. And of course, we're all very busy in veterinary medicine, even now during this strange time, that getting technicians involved with that follow-up is probably the most important part, you know, getting your veterinary nurse to really be the, the champion of a weight loss program in your clinic. So we have all kinds of great, you know, wonderful equations here to really kind of understand maintenance energy requirements and how we might improve uh, weight loss by giving a certain amount. And you can see that, that you know, the, the average dog is uh, eating probably 30 to 40 percent more than an obesity prone dog. And no matter how you do your calculations, and we'll go through a couple of them just to, for pastime's sake for those veterinarians on the call here. Um, and then we can see that cats really and I think what we have to point out with cats versus dogs is that cats really don't have an active uh, energy requirement. It's been pretty well proven that cats who sit in your house as an indoor cat or a cat who's in the middle of a Manhattan apartment really are at resting energy requirement. There is no increased metabolic factor for activity. I don't care how many times you chase a feather around the, the apartment or whether you're chasing a laser pointer a couple times a day. Energy requirement for a cat is at resting. Dogs can, of course, be highly variable. And so we have to just really kind of make our, what I call them a swag, a scientific wild ass guess as to what the energy requirement will be for weight loss. And we'll go through a little bit about a little bit of that. I think as you saw on that, that last slide, we talk about uh, using sort of an exponential equation, right? The, you know, the uh, 70 or up to 130 times the kig body weight uh, to the to the 0.75 power, or you can do it in more of a linear fashion, which is 30 times the, the weight in kigs plus 70 times a metabolic factor of like 1.1 for the obesity crone all the way up to 1.8 or 2 times that for the active dog. You know, that said, we do have some problems with linear and exponential because we have little chihuahuas and then we have Great Danes. And if we use that linear equation, we really start to overassume calories in our bigger dogs, which is a really big problem from Labrador on, on up in terms of size. And that's why we as veterinarians like to kind of stick with the exponential equation because it's a little more true to the metabolic uh, energy requirements based on that. So, you know, who's your typical candidate and who's the history? And this is the typical thing, golden retriever, BML spade comes in at 95, 98 pounds, whatever, seems to be somewhat inactive, goes out for a couple of walks a day, and you're get, being fed two cups in the morning, very typical. It's what's on the bag, right? You know, two cups in the morning, two cups at night, getting a couple of treats, and we know that that dog is getting somewhere around 1,400 kcals just from the food, and maybe even getting more kcals from something else, right? Um, so this is where, you know, where is the real diet history coming into to, you know, to account here? And this is what we tend not to get. And what it was amazing to see what Dr. Andrew was going through this. Really, these people come in and they really kind of give a really detailed history. 
And uh, I always, I always think of veterinary medicine as, 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 a, as an episode of house where nobody's really ever telling the truth. And, and one, you know, milk bone treat is really three milk bone treats. And we never get anything from the table is he gets a bowl of Cheerios because the kid drops it every morning. So we really have to try and figure out what they're getting. And when, when people were questioned, the, the, the reality is, is that the average owner was feeding around 20 to 25% of calories from table foods and stuff that's in the house, not even you know, counting in the treats that they were feeding too. And then what kind of treats are they feeding? You know, all this information is extremely important from the pig ears to the raw hides, to the bully sticks, to the sweet potato chews. And we have to have an idea of what they're getting into. And then, you know, lastly is the dog that's in and out of the house a lot and, you know, being on a, you know, free leash, uh, on a uh, free, uh, free roaming and then getting into things. And I had an owner whose dog came in every December with you know, an extra 15 pounds and it was because that dog would go out in deer guts, okay, out in the woods because the hunters were leaving him in the back 40 where he let everybody hunt on his property. Then by the summer, he'd look pretty great, short of the parasitism from all the things he was eating. He would actually lose 20 pounds by the summer because he was just getting his two cups, uh, you know, in the morning, two cups uh, at night as a, as a Great Dane cross. But in the winter, he would gain a lot of weight and then lose it in the summers. So all that's the history we need to know. And so here's just, you know, the math of, of how we would do the calculations, really not that important. But the reality is, is once we kind of assume what the maintenance energy requirement would be at the ideal body weight, not at the obese body weight, we then have to cut them back. And I'm usually very aggressive trying to get to 60% of that quote unquote maintenance energy requirement in an effort to uh, really get a good uh, amount of weight loss within that first month of weight loss because when folks aren't successful, they give up. When they are successful, we throw a little party, everybody's excited and we can actually get better compliance when they see that they're making progress early in, in, in the entire um, weight loss uh, program. And that said, you know, this is, this is kind of easy to feed because I can feed two cups of that previous food that was around 350 kcals a cup and a couple of milk bones and pretty much be you know, assured that I'm gonna meet most of the vitamin mineral sufficiency, which I think is always the interesting part because when you go on diets, how often are, are our clients meeting their quote unquote vitamin and mineral recommended daily allowance in the veterinary and the human side? And I think that's an interesting concept to, to bring up, you know, about on the human side because I know that in certain cases, we're probably not meeting that, particularly in the really tough cases, we're probably not meeting vitamin and mineral sufficiency. But, you know, we're expecting with that kind of an, uh, you know, that kind of an approach, maybe one to 2% weight loss per week. We try to kind of hone in on 2% being ideal, 1% being a little bit on the light side, 3% being phenomenal. And that's quite a, you know, quite a bit of weight loss. Um, but once we kind of, you know, if we can get to that two or three percent and show people that we're getting that in the first month, uh, we tend to get a slightly better accountability. And then having them come in for those routine uh, weigh-ins every every two to four weeks. We like four weeks because four weeks allows uh, for some, you know, some pretty good weight loss, particularly during a transition period of foods in the beginning. But we know that folks love to feed. They love treats. They love to feed things from the table. Begging behaviors are going to increase. Aggression behaviors increase. Food seeking behaviors increase. So how do we actually try to address all these problems where we see increased satiety? And that's where this whole idea of therapeutic or over-the-counter foods, right? I just said we just fed that previous golden retriever two cups of his old food and a couple of milk bones to see if we could get some weight loss. But the reality is, is that sometimes the therapeutic foods are really needed these veterinarian prescription diets that everybody gives you a hard time about, why do they cost so much? Well, it's because they are formulated to be a little bit superior in, in a handful of ways. If we look at the over-the-counter light foods and the biggest problem I have with so, this whole idea of like, let's just give something over-the-counter like, you know, pedigree weight control management or whatever that it's called. The bottom line is that we don't really understand the digestibility of those. It's all basically based on calculations that the company does to label the bag. And so it might say that there's metabolizable energy at 30, you know, uh, you know 3,000 kcals per kg and 222 kcals per cup. Looks pretty great because it's only got 220 calories. The previous food that they were on had 350, so it might be a good way to go. But when you actually look at some of those over-the-counter foods, they not only don't, a lot of them don't really comply with what we'll call light regulations. And so 
if you actually say, okay, I'm going to feed pedigree weight control management instead of pedigree, weight control management means nothing. There's actually the term light or reduced fat that means something in the quote unquote AFCO regulations. That means it has to be or, you know, less than 9% dry matter and fat. If I make something that's called weight management or you know, calorie control, it basically means it has a few calories than the previous food and may only have five fewer calories, but it then complies with their idea that it's a light or a, a, or a quote unquote weight management food. So you really have to look for the idea of reduced fat or light on the bag to really understand that it actually is complying with an AFCO regulation. But the reality is, is you have to look at the kcals per cup on the bag because everybody feeds in cups to their dogs and their cats. So they're gonna want to see something that's lower in calories. And then we get to the problem of the kcals on that guaranteed analysis on the bag really may not comply. And so here's an example of what you might see on a bag, right? It's got 24% uh, protein, 12% fat, NFE would be carbohydrate, which is 44%. And when you do the calculations based on the modified Atwater's equations, which is modified to be lower digestibility because it's in a dog food, which probably has lower digestibility than all these wonderful substrates in a human food, we get a KCAL quantification of 340 calories in 100 grams. And that's based on this modified Atwater equation. Well, when we look at what might be the reality in that food is that just because it says it's 24% protein minimum, it might be 26% protein. It says 12% fat on the bag, but it might be 14% fat on the bag. So when you actually do that and then you know, look at the calculations of the kcals per gram of protein, per gram of fat, and you know, per gram of carbohydrate, we may be closer to 400 calories and we just don't really know based on the fact that we don't know anything about the digestibility. So what the real guaranteed analysis is could be far higher than what the actual published one is on the bag. So we start to understand that if we're going to feed, you know, four cups a day or, you know, go down to two cups a day, we could be actually adding in an extra 110 or 120 calories, which is going to make weight loss a lot harder with those over-the-counter foods. So these therapeutic foods, of course, we know the calorie content. They've done studies on it. We pretty, or we're pretty solid in understanding that a cup of OM is 266 calories. Always has been, always will be. We also know that it's actually been in increased, um, has an increased protein content to help the dog or cat maintain lean body mass during that weight loss program. While a lot of the foods that are out there that are going to go over the counter tend to be lower in protein because they're meant for senior dogs. So we know that that might be beneficial and there've been studies out there to show that lean mass retention is better. We know that carnitine in cats in particular has been shown in two studies now to improve the overall lean mass retention during weight loss. So that's kind of an important concept, whether we're using carnitine or protein enhancement in the food. And lastly, we talk about fiber and we know that there are a lot of foods out there that helps uh, that, you know, the fiber that's in there kind of, you know, bulks up the food, increases the gastric fill. However, there have not been a lot of long-term studies showing that fiber is actually going to improve the weight loss, but it's been shown that the second meal after giving a high fiber content could be beneficial. So that's kind of an important concept uh, where we, we think that fiber can sort of help curb the appetite a little bit. So that's about dogs primarily. We know dogs are, are easy. It's easy. It's always been easy for me to just, you know, say, hey, I had a, you know, three-legged, that's my dog on the bottom. That was Roxy. She ended up becoming a three-legged dog due to an angular limb deformity. And you know, we knew we had to keep the weight off and she ate two cups in the morning, two cups at night, never asked for anything. We would once in a while give her a treat and she was almost neglected from, from a food point of view, but she kept a really nice lean condition. We used to run sled dogs, all those dogs were in phenomenal condition, but I, I do have a cat and that was my cat Kermit down on the bottom. And, and you can see he's kind of rotund. He's always had a little bit of a belly and I, really never addressed it because I knew it was going to be hard to address obesity in a cat. And so, you know, Kermit, of course, was in our typical situation, the multi-cat household, where we had two cats with different body types. One's a little bit rotund. The other one's a cat who's on an enteric diet due to GI problems. And he would always try to steal her food. So how do I actually get around her being able to eat her food in peace and quiet without being tortured by my cat who's now going to be calorie restricted. So we're trying to get him to lose a little weight. And so I built what's called the Fat No More box uh, that was in my 
closet and uh, it took me better part of a day to make that little opening in the Fat No More box just big enough for her to get in to get to her food and he couldn't get into it because he was just too big. Now that was my rendition and I will guarantee you that there are very cool things out there that you can actually buy. They're like little mazes. They go into a small area and they have to go around a maze to get to it and the fat cat really can't get to it. Um, and so those are the kind of things we have to start thinking about in the multi-cat household where I'm not so sure we have to think about that in the multi-human household, but maybe we do. If we look at problem two is the fact that cats don't eat a lot. So it comes down to who's feeding the cat. And this was my little experiment where I gave my three kids the ability to feed the cat. And I said, let's, you know, let's give Kermit his quarter scoop. And so that my, you know, I've got the generous, as you can see on top, that was actually my daughter because she's a generous person and she loves that cat to death. So she would put a little bit extra and you can see it peeking over the top. Max, who could care less about what the cat's eating, he just wanted to get back to whatever he was doing. I call him the chintzy and you can't see any food peeking over the top on the chintzy while the precise was Ben and he was about leveling things off and that's how he's always been in his life. And you can see if I actually look at the grams that they're given, 26 up to 29 or 23 up to 29, that's about a 24 to 25 kcal difference in feeding a cat twice a day. So that's 50 calories, which can make a huge difference in a cat who should only be getting 250 calories to 200 calories, depending on their body size every day, all the way down to 160. And we're usually reducing cats down to 120 calories a day during a weight loss protocol, which makes it extremely difficult. And the best way around this solution, and it's been shown in studies, that if you have a kitchen scale and you actually weigh out the grams every day, you're going to be far better off in a weight loss program for a cat. Now we have this third problem, which is sanity. And that's a big problem when you have a cat who is now at your door, butting his head against it every single night and getting woken up every night. If he gets into the room with a paw on the face, incessant meowing, fighting with the other cat. And then I ended up having to sleep in another room because the cat was bothering us so much that my cat, my wife said, you're feeding him more or, or, or you're sleeping in a different room so he can bother you and not me. And the reality is, is we found a slight solution around that, which is actually chopped zucchini. Every night we would actually feed him double his amount by putting chopped zucchini in. And strangely enough, about 60 to 70% of cats will eat zucchini and it does keep them satiated, strangely enough. I picked this up from a, 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 a French nutritionist in the middle of my, my, my dismay. And she just said, why don't you feed zucchini? And I just said, no, cat's gonna eat zucchini. Strangely enough, if you chop it about the same size as the cat food, a lot of cats will eat it and it does improve the satiety. So I'll get woken up at four instead of two. So, I mean, all these same pitfalls in terms of food equals love really you know, do sort of fit the same, the same, uh, same mantra as dog OBC management. And the reality is, is we always know that, that the multi-cat household is more difficult. We also know that most of the cats out there are at resting energy, so we have to go really low in calories. We know cats are more nocturnal. We know they eat multiple meals during the day. We know that they get muscle wasted quicker. So these are all the things that we have to try to pay attention to in an effort to really address the, the cat obesity problems and make sure that our clients are aware that this is gonna be a harder, a harder sell um, from, from a veterinary point of view to get owners to comply. Lastly, activity. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of activity. However, I just don't think it's really possible to get many cats active. And this is a favorite bedtime story for my daughter about Danger, the dog yard cat, who was the only cat to ever run the Iditarod. And it's a great book if anybody gets a chance to read it. And this was the only active cat I think I've ever really met because it's just hard to get activity uh, in a cat. But dogs are a different story because we can convince owners to potentially go out. And, and, and what we did is we actually wanted to convince owners and we enrolled just a handful of dogs here. And I'm sure Dr. Andrew's gonna laugh at 35 dogs when uh, human trials have hundreds and sometimes thousands. But in the end, we uh, enrolled 35 dogs and we did a, a two week washout uh, using Superior OM to get their relative KCAL consumption and, and what it took to keep them alive. Hypothetically, we put pedometers and we tracked their daily activity. We were encouraging uh, owners to walk, you know, two miles four to five times a week. And then what we ended up realizing is that getting people to get active was almost impossible. 
And even the people that we were trying to get active, some were, some were not. So we basically just cut our group right down the middle and said, okay, active dogs versus inactive dogs told everybody, instead of trying to get a placebo group that weren't in it, were inactive. We basically just said, okay, everybody, you should try to walk as much as you can. And then we actually took our pedometer readings to try to stratify them into an active and an inactive group. And <clears throat> what we found is that in the washout period, they were going about 7,000 steps on an average across the entire cohort. And then we looked at the one month step interval after we were encouraging everybody to go, 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 rah, rah, rah. And they were going about 7,000 steps. And then the last month, which is about uh, four to five months into this study, they were going about 7,000 steps a day. So bottom line is owners don't walk more when you tell them to do the, the walking. And, uh, it's usually very short lived, even if they do. And so I think this is one of the harder things is how do we get activity? So we basically took that cohort and said, okay, right down the middle, the active group on the top end versus the inactive group. And we just basically looked at the average steps and everything else from body conditions to weights before and after, percent weight loss during this dietary uh, intervention uh, really were no different. The only things that were different were, of course, the steps that they took to the per day on their pedometers. And then we also saw the KCAL consumption was different between the two groups to lose the same amount of weight as we tracked them. And we were adjusting diets all the way through to try to get at least 1%, between one and 2% per week. The time on the trial, their overall weight loss were no different, but the dogs in the active group could eat 11 kcals per kg to the metabolic uh, power of 0.75 or exponential power of 0.75. They really could eat a little bit more during the actual trial and because they were more active from what we could deduce. So when we kind of put this into a regression, it was about a thousand steps. Uh, for every thousand steps was about a one kcal expenditure to the metabolic body weight for these dogs. And so if we put that in a Labrador perspective, it was about 20 to 25 calories per thousand steps, which was about 50 to 60 kcals per mile for the average dog. So let's think about what we do. We take them for a nice mile or a two mile walk. We come home, we feed them a biscuit, a treat, and then they go chew on their little rawhide or they go eat their, their milk bone and they basically put all that weight right back on. So I think it's really hard to get activity to be a component of it, even though I think it's great for the owners and I think it does help with the overall compliance of the program. It's really hard to get activity to be a major um, quest in terms of uh, calorie uh, expenditure. So any questions, feel free to ask them. I'm sure uh, we'll have a few here and uh, Dr. Andrew can answer most of them for us. <laughs> Such uh, fantastic talks. Thank you so much to Dr. Andrew and Dr. Wachschlag. I enjoyed uh, listening to both of your talks so much. I would like to first open it up for questions that you might have for each other. And, uh, and then uh, anybody in the audience, if you wanna shoot any questions via the chat, um, I can read those out to our speakers as well. I think I just wanted to, um, if that was a great talk. So I found it so interesting to hear your side of things. And I think there is a lot of overlap, actually. Um, I was thinking about you know, when you made the comment about how it's hard to get a dietary history, of, you know, um, from the owners. And it's actually also challenging to get that from humans. I think people, you know, it, it varies a lot. Like I have some people who are very honest, but then there are other people who come to see me who are just on the defensive and don't really want to share exactly what they're doing, aren't aware of what they're doing. So I have to get them to actually write down what they're having for a week and bring it in because they just can't really remember or don't want to remember what they're having on the day to day. So that was interesting. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. It's, 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 it's funny how the longer you spend with a, a, a you know, a client, the more you learn. And if you're just there for 15 minutes, just saying, hey, what, what's the diet history? What's going on? But as you develop a rapport with them, you start to figure out, oh, he gets pizza crust every Friday night, right? Because you're developing that relationship. And I'm sure you find out more and more about what they're doing. You know, we had, we had a guy who said, oh, I, I feed baby carrots. And we didn't think much of it. Okay, what's a baby carrot? And then you know, the second visit, dog doesn't lose much weight. And you're like, well, gosh, you know, how many baby carrots are you feeding? He's like, two bags a day. I'm like, 
God, there's like 600 calories in, in two bags of bacon, yeah. right? Uh, now, had, now we're getting <laughs> Joe, I had, a, I had a similar owner that was feeding um, apples to their dog. And I had yeah. this similar thing where I, I was pretty sure the owner was being honest. And, I, and it, just, it just dawned on me to ask him how many apple slices he was feeding. And he was feeding a whole bag of apples to his yeah. dog every day. A bag. I'm sure people do the same thing. Like, you know, it's like, oh, I it's only healthy. Okay. I eat rice cakes and you sit back and go, oh, rice cakes are low calorie. That's a good, you know, snack. And it's like, we eat four sleeves of them. That's okay, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, the same thing with, you know, just like assessing who else is in the house. So like when you showed the, that great, you know, slide with what your kids were feeding the cat, um, for me, it's important to ask about who the person lives with and what their behaviors are like, because it's hard when someone, even if they're really motivated, if their spouse isn't especially supportive, is, mm -hmm. um, you know, buying junk food, keeping it in the house, won't give it up. That makes it so much more challenging for a person, you know, trying to lose weight. Um, and also if they have kids, they need to have some food in the house for the kids, might be some, some you know, junk food around. How do yeah. they kind of manage that and control their eating around that? Yeah, don't come to my house. Yeah. <laughs> it, would, it would be, a, or you'd be appalled at like, you know, what the kids are eating and then we're trying to be healthy. I'm eating salads every night and, you know, I, I can't lose an ounce, but, you know. It's, well, I think, Joe, Joe we, we can just put you in the fat box, you know. <laughs> <laughs> With the cheese that's in the fat box, you can't get to them. Yeah, that's brilliant. I hadn't heard of that one. <laughs> that's okay. so good. Um, we are getting a lot of questions from the audience. I'm going to ask a few of these, and uh, we can certainly still have open discussion. Um, one question was zucchini. I suppose it is raw, not cooked. Should it be um, twenty seconds in the microwave? Yeah, I figured uh, cooked is better. It's more digestible, correct? Yeah, hypothetically, it's really just filler, and I never saw any GI disturbances in my cat from it. And we would just put it in in the in the microwave just to kind of you know heat it up a little bit. You can cook it. Everybody, you know, everybody has their each cat's different. So I would say you know just lightly cook it if it's not really going well. Cook it more if that's not going well. Do it raw and see what happens. But. Okay. Um, another participant is asking, what do you do about people that say the dogs do not get enough nutrients on the lower amounts of food? Yep. Oh, I mean, that's why we do higher protein foods. And, and I, you know, I'll be honest with you when we have some of those really difficult cases, somebody else, I think in the chat said, you know, what do you think about home prepared? And we do a lot of, strangely enough, it sounds like a, a human diet, which would be, which would be chicken breast and vegetables, right? We do a lot of that because um, in the end, it's about getting the protein sufficiencies, the calories add, you know, the vegetables add that bulk. And, you know, strangely enough, most dogs will just go ahead and eat, a, eat, a, eat three or four cups of green beans, particularly Labradors. People are probably harder. And I, I guess that's where, that's where I'm kind of interested in, in, in how do you get snacking and, and calorie fill or, or gastric fill in people? Because we'd use the vegetables and some dogs hate it. So, you know, you know I, I've always been like, oh, rice cakes. Everybody's told me rice cakes. Like, what is the gastric fill? You know, you know we do lots of cellulose in, in veterinary medicine. How do you get that in, in the human world? Yeah, I think um, just getting, right, getting fiber in um, by really vegetables also for, for humans as well. Um, I encourage people, you know, with their meals to fill at least half a plate with salad or vegetables and then get the protein as well. Um, because we know that that, and, and start the meal with the vegetables or salad too, so that it helps you feel more full. Um, fiber is really just like the way to go with, with the diet. It's going to help you feel more full. It can help control blood sugar. Um, and then drinking a lot of water is important too. Um, you can add a fiber supplement, although for weight loss, that's not necessarily that helpful, but um, I would say really just, yeah, like the, the vegetables, the green beans, same as for the yeah. Labradors, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what, I mean, you know, a lot of folks do complain, and that's also a question here, is that 
you know, how do you, you know, people say they're not getting the nutrients they need because you're going so low. We often recommend, strangely enough, Centrum, <laughs> right? Give a Centrum multivitamin because I know your, your, yeah. your dad's only eating like 12 ounces of chicken breast, two and a half cups of veggies, still having a hard time losing weight. And I'm trying to make sure that there's at least some, some vitamin mineral sufficiency and we're putting in things like, you know, Centrum, Centrum Silver or, uh, you know, one a day as, as their true vitamin mineral supplement because they recommended daily ounces aren't that different from dog and human, to be honest with you. I mean, are, are, are multivitamins a, a big part of what you're doing too? Not really. I think my approach is more if someone's eating a balanced diet and that they're getting a lot of, you know, fruits and vegetables and they're getting some meat, um, they shouldn't need to supplement with a multivitamin. Um, I will check a few vitamin levels when they first come to see me, mostly vitamin D and B12. Um, and if they're deficient, then treat those. But um, I tend to tell people, actually, you don't, you don't necessarily need the multivitamin. You can take it if you want, but you don't need it if you're eating a pretty balanced diet. Yeah. So we've got the problem of no vitamin D in, in dogs unless you take it in orally. So that's one of our major concerns is vitamin D. Um, you know, they're probably getting vitamin A from the vegetables. The vitamin E may be lower. And actually, if you look at the RDA for dogs, it's probably hypothetically about two to three fold higher for most things than human, you know, based on, on body, body weight. So okay. that would be overkill in the, in, the, in the vet world because we have this whole AFCO thing of what you absolutely need to make a dog food complete and balanced so that every dog in the world lives versus the RDAs for humans, which, you know, you guys are like 1.2 milligrams of copper, right? For uh, or 1.5 or something like that for a daily consumption of copper. While we're at, uh, you know, 1.7 for a Labrador, right? So, um, so yeah, that's a little bit different in terms yeah, of- Yeah, it's very different. I have, yeah. a, I have a couple of questions on the human side. They're both related. So one uh, participant said, so in humans, there is a movement toward low carb, high fat, moderate protein with keto diet. Is there any data out there regarding high fat, moderate protein diets in dogs and cats for weight loss? What is the highest protein percent and fat percent that can be fed to cats and dogs if trying a low carb diet like this? And then let me just ask the other question that's related. Keto diet. I did this for a year because of early insulin resistance. It worked great for reducing appetite. I suspect from lack of carbs triggering insulin carving, insulin carvings, cravings. Sorry, is there more evidence now that these diets may help long term with appetite and diabetes and cardiovascular? So essentially, you know, keto diets, um, recommendations for humans, and then how does how can that relate to to? Uh... Um. Yeah, well, definitely the keto diet in humans has been shown to help with weight loss, insulin resistance. Um, it's being looked at as um, potentially beneficial in certain types of cancer. There's a lot of um, research looking into that right now. Um, you know, in terms of long-term research, I'm not aware of anything long-term yet. Doesn't mean it's not out there, but um, I think keto is just so hard to stick to long-term that... Um, it's, I, I don't really recommend it. It's not, not that it's unsafe or anything. It's just, um, it's hard for people to live like that. So you can do it. I find that most people can do it for, you know, a few weeks, maybe a few months, um, but it's rare to be able to do it much longer than that. And what is so hard about keto is that it's not really the kind of diet that you can do on and off. Um, you need to be on it and really just stay on it and you can't be off it for a few days and then get back on easily. So, um, you know, it's definitely beneficial, a lot of potential benefits. And I think really the major downside is just how difficult it is to stick to long-term. Yeah, I don't think it's a problem of sticking to it in terms of the, I mean, there's plenty of foods out there that have that sort of, uh, we'll call it the, the keto approach to it and there are all kinds of raws and freeze-dried foods out there that have low carb and everybody says that they're, you know, there's some panacea. I, I don't think they're, I, I mean, I still think calorie restriction is still the key. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've had too many cases where people have been like, my neighbor told me that I should go feed this Evo stuff because it's got no carbs. And I can't believe my dog gained six pounds. And it's like, well, 
yeah, you're on 350 calories per cup. Now you're on 506 and you're feeding the same amount. So yes, your dog's going to gain weight. Um, and I think uh, Bob Backus did a nice sort of longevity study in, in cats where they fed them, you know, a, a keto type diet or a high protein, higher fat versus a, a you know, modest protein, uh, lower fat diet and showed that the cats actually you know, gained more weight when they were on the quote unquote keto. So I think, I think it can be used in terms of the insulin resistance. And then cats, as we know, you know, if you put them on carb, uh, you know, low carb diets, their diabetes, some of them can go into remission and cats are, are a little bit closer to people in terms of, of the type two situation for diabetes. However, when you look at the epidemiologic data, it really doesn't pan out that food is the major driver of the obesity or of the diabetes problem that we see in cats. It's really obesity is the major driver. And everybody's like, well, it's dry foods are the problem because dry foods are so calorie dense and they're high in carb. And the reality is, is there's never been that association between a higher fat or a higher carb food as to what's driving that, that whole, uh, that problem. And it was of course shown that indoor living was a bigger problem. So why aren't we letting all of our cats outside? Now I'm sure you're just gonna be appalled with that, Ilani. You know, living in the no, no, I let my own cat outside. <laughs> okay, okay, good. And the reality is, is that that outdoor living is is an active lifestyle versus sitting on my couch. No, of course. I mean, that's why cats are obese. They're, you know, they're they're bored inside. Yeah. Um, no, it's such great mm. discussion. I have um, some really, gosh, like such great questions. Um, so, Dr. Andrew, thinking of veterinary students and their battle with weight. What do you suggest to those, I'm, I'm sure medical students have the same battle, but you know, uh, so veterinary students, what do you suggest to those who have limited time and access to the more advanced care you describe? Many actually fall in the obese body condition category. I worry about their long-term health. And another question for you, Dr. Andrew, what do you think about intermittent fasting for weight loss? Okay, so I'll answer the in intermittent fasting one first. Um, I think that intermittent fasting can work for weight loss. The studies um, really show their different findings based on what study you look at. Some show that it helps with weight loss. There was one that just came out that showed that it didn't help with weight loss. Um, and so it's really about what works for you. Everyone's different with weight loss and what works for one person is not gonna work for another. So if you're interested in intermittent fasting, I would say try it and see how it works for you. Um, the best way to do it or the easiest way is probably to eat within a six to eight hour window. Um, there are some other ways of trying it. Um, but if it's a struggle every day to, to stay within that window, then um, it's probably not the right plan for you and something else would be better. Um, but I have some patients who really like it because it just works with their lifestyle. They like that they don't have to worry about what they're eating, how much they're eating. Um, and so that, you know, is very appealing to some people. Um, in terms of the, so vet students, and I guess also medical students, I'm sure it's similar, very busy, um, maybe don't have as much time as you would like to kind of take care of yourself. Um, I guess I would say, um, you know, just really trying to get on a healthy eating plan in whatever way you can. So that's going to be um, really back to the basics in terms of eating, eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, avoiding highly processed foods. If you can, trying to cook, I know that that might be hard as a student, but the more you can do that, the better. And then getting an exercise as well in some way. Um, and then, I mean, I think if you're, if you feel like you are really struggling, um, maybe trying to find someone who does what I do um, near you or uh, virtually talk to someone because losing weight, if you're interested in that, is really hard to do on your own. And um, it's, it's really helpful to have someone kind of guiding you and, um, you know, that can be really important. But just, yeah, getting back to the healthy eating, nothing restrictive, nothing, no fad diets, just you know, basic healthy eating. Great advice. Um, Dr. Wachschlag, a couple questions here for you. Do we have information on weight gain with gabapentin or SSRI for dogs? And the other question is um, why, curious to know why canned and raw diets are not recommended by you for weight loss. Lowering carbs is so helpful for weight loss. Mm. Yeah. 
Uh, the first thing, I don't think we have any information on, on any use uh, of the, I'll, I'll call it the, you know, the gabapentins, pregabalins, and, and, and any of the SSRIs on, on overall weight gain. I think it definitely is an area for some, some research. And it's very interesting to see all the various things that are being used in human medicine as, as uh, appetite suppressants and you know, metformin for, it's an oldie, but a goodie. And why, why haven't we studied these kinds of things in dogs? I think it's, it's really an interesting thing. And it's like, it's, it's fruit that's ripe for the picking in, in the canine world for sure. And I think that uh, uh, the, the idea of, of raw, well, I'll just say that I, I don't use raw just because I have too many, too many health concerns, uh, particularly not knowing households and who's immunosuppressed and how many kids are around. And, and uh, I don't want to be the guy who's, who's responsible for their salmonella problem in the household or the enterogenic, uh, enteropathogenic E. coli that the kid picked up. So I just tend to stay away from it and tell people to cook and then leave it up to them as to whether they want to be raw versus cooked. And there's really not much difference. Uh, the, the carb story just really hasn't panned out to be uh, anything that we can write about at this point. Now, I just mentioned I do chicken and vegetables, which is pretty much a as low carb as you can get and, and usually quite low in fat. We usually add a little bit of oil in for various essential fatty acids. And we do it and I see great success. It's those dogs that are on the commercial foods, which I think we can almost akin that, you know, to what Dr. Andrew was talking about, the processed foods is processed. It's highly digestible starches. And uh, you can't get away from those in, in commercial kibble. And I think that's part of our problem is the caloric density of that and the quote unquote processed food concept you know, right there. And the whole idea of the microbiome, we haven't even really touched that in veterinary medicine yet and how that might be influencing things. But I do think that the, the chicken breast and vegetable and, and one centrum and a couple of Tums diet has been phenomenally successful for a lot of dogs that were on that brink of like, I don't know what to do. My dog can't lose weight on two cups of, you know, uh, metabolic by Hills. What do I do? Strangely enough, those dogs tend to do quite well on that. So I do think there's a place for it, but I just don't know if we're there from a research perspective. And I'd love for any of the companies that are doing the raw stuff or the home prepared or the, you know, uh, you know, some of these uh, home prepared foods that are, you know, the nom nom nows, the pet plates, the farmer's dogs, like, let, you know, step to the plate and let's try and get some work done to try and figure out how we can use those diets potentially effectively for, for weight loss or better glycemic control. I like that advice. I'll have to try that diet, uh, Joe. Uh, I have a question uh, for Dr. Andrew. Uh, is it uncommon to use, oh, it says it is uncommon to use pharmacology for weight loss in veterinary patients, true. Um, what qualifies a human patient for this? Uh, for example, failing a weight loss program without pharmacology, a threshold BMI. Um, so, um, right. So there the criteria for using a, a medication for weight loss is typically a BMI greater than 30. Um, so putting someone in the, what's classified as class one obesity or above, or if someone is in the overweight category, but they have a comorbidity, so hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, that's how they would qualify. Um, I think the people who tend to be interested in weight loss medications are those who have tried many different diets, have maybe lost weight, gained it back, feel really frustrated um, and want to try something different because we know now that diets really don't work well or they work well for the short term. And then it's so common for people to gain the weight back. So the meds are a new option for relatively new option for people um, who have really struggled with weight loss in the past. That's great, thank you. Uh, there are a few other questions, but I'm just looking at the clock and it's already 8.20 p.m. Uh, I think I'm going to thank everybody. Uh, we had over 300 people uh, log in tonight. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Wachschlag and Dr. Andrew. This was really phenomenal. I, uh, I can't thank you enough for participating.